morning, everybody. Thank you again for being here. And um, as Dion mentioned, I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance. We're based in New York. We're one of the nation's largest organizations working to end the drug war and to envision drug policies that are grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. And one, uh, a few years ago, we had the opportunity to collaborate with filmmaker Eugene Jarecki, um, who um, developed, who produced this amazing film, The House I Live In, uh, which basically chronicles the drug war and calls for an end to mass incarceration and for a rethinking of our nation's drug laws. And just recently, one of the things that he, he's done is to develop this very short call to action, call to the movement to come together and end the drug war. So it's about two and a half minutes, and I would love to show it. So it gives us a framing of the history of the drug war, why we are here, and why the drug war, this, the why the drug war is having a disparate impact on black communities, and more so what Dion and I are going to delve into is why it's having a disparate impact on black women and black families. So, Turn the other one. Google 
an internal error with that video. That's an internal error with that video. Okay, so I think we can, we can just, yeah, we should go for it. Let's go for it, yes. So, get the lights going on, we don't have to be in the dark at this point. So basically, so Ms. Do we toss coins, I guess. I guess you go first. And um, one of the things that excited me, just knowing that this conference was happening and that there was an opportunity to talk about the war on drugs, our current drug policies, and its impact on our communities, is that there are so many intersections. And as you see, the topic of our talk is sort of the war on drugs, its impact on women and the intersectionalities that exist. And um, as women, as sisters who are working to, to, to ensure that there is, there is black women's health is promoted, and it's promoted in a way that um, builds community, and as Dion, as Dion mentioned, but in thinking about that, it's something that's also very striking is that when we talk about health, that when we talk about impact, it doesn't include a full conversation about drugs and drug use. And that is, that it, there are a number of reasons for why that is. It could be our own, uh, our own feelings, our own thoughts, our own philosophies about, about drugs. And it's something that we, we, we ignore. Right, uh, but it's there, and it's the full part, an integral part of our of our lives, of our communities, and we know people that work with people and live with people who are impacted by drugs. Uh, but it's just not part of that health conversation that's happening in our communities. So I'm going to talk start up a little bit about uh, talking about the history of the drug war. Started in 19 in 1971, uh, Richard President Richard Nixon declared war on drugs, and in the 80s, uh, President Reagan just escalated what that means, and by putting uh, allocating millions and millions of dollars more to fighting the drug war, um, and a lot of it is sort of fu is fueled by the by the what's considered the crack epidemic. Um, and at the height of that, we had Nancy Reagan and her say no to say no to drugs. We had um, you know media sensationalizing the you know the drug use in the black community, and then it sort of capped off with uh, Len Bias death, where Congress really put the stamp on. Um, on the issue by passing mandatory minimum sentences, um, which sent a lot of people in our communities away for a very long time. And one of the questions that I usually you know, throw out to audiences, and especially when I'm doing presentations like this to faith communities, it's how did we miss so many people leaving our communities? Um, we have 2.2 million people in prison today, over five and half a million, um, special, mostly black and brown uh, community members are in prison for non-violent drug offense. And how did we miss almost a million people going away in about, in four decades? Um, what does that say about how we build community, how we engage community, and when we think holistically about what it means to have healthy communities, um, what are some of the signs and factors that we need to put in place to ensure that we're, we're raising a generation of children whose, whose parents are incarcerated. And they're coming home, and we also need to figure out what to do when they come home, and what, how does that fall into a full um, health uh, framework. So just to throw out some things that you may already know, um, so drug use and drug selling occur at similar rates um, across racial lines and ethnic, racial and ethnic groups, right? Um, but however, black and Latino women are more likely to be criminalized um, because of the drug law violation. We also know that black women are two times as likely, and Latino women are, are about a time and a half more likely to be to be in prison. 
uh, between 1977 and 2011, the, this, the, in, in state prison and in federal prison, we had a 900% increase in the number of women who were going to, who were, who were being incarcerated. Uh, more than 25% of the women in state prison were incarcerated for a drug law violation. That was, I think, 11% 11, 11 more than men, the number of men that were incarcerated. And by the end of 2012, we had 58% of the women in federal prison were there because of a drug offense. Also, because black women, at, across the line, black women are not, are less, are, it's, it's at equal rates um, with white women likely to use drugs during pregnancy. However, black women are more likely, I think it's according to a study produced by, uh, a report from the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, are almost 60% more likely to be reported to child welfare agencies. Um, we have about 120,000 women mothers behind bars right now. Um, two thirds of the parents are incarcerated again. These are nonviolent drug offenses. 2.7 million children are, are have a parent that has a parent that is behind bars. One in 28, um, it's the overall number. However, one in nine black children uh, has a parent that is incarcerated. Um, 80, 80, about 89%, and I'm sorry I'm throwing out all these numbers, and you know, the Jarecki piece would have framed it a lot differently. Um, and 62% of folks in state prisons, they are housed at more than 100 miles away from, away from them. Um, pregnant women are less likely to get prenatal care while they're in prison and I know many of you in the room have been working um, on the anti-shackling bans and getting, I don't know if you are aware, um, but in many prisons across the country and Dion can talk a lot more about this than I can, um, women are shackled during childbirth. Uh, which I think is one of the most barbaric things that could be done um, at yeah, a time when you're living life and producing life to be shackled uh, to your to your to the hospital bed while you when you when you're when you in labor. So there are a number of organizations working working to to end um, shackling during childbirth, um, and that's just one. Um, one of the areas where you know there is a direct link to help is to help outcomes. Um, you know, a child being born in prison, a child who is born while the parent is being shackled, um, women who are not having access to health care while they're incarcerated. Um, the other area uh, that I focus on and you know have been paying a lot of attention to is the felony food stamp ban. And I'm not sure if you were aware that back in 1996, uh, when President Clinton uh, ended welfare as we know it, uh, with the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, um, one of the stipulations of that act was if you were convicted in state or federal court of a drug law violation or a drug law felony, you were denied access to federal benefits, including um, TANF and SNAP. And what we've seen is the states that have implemented the full-on ban is that it's having a disproportional impact on women and it's having a disproportional impact on black women who are, you know, we're seeing a lot more uh, women who are, you know, need access to food and don't have access to food. Um, there are about 180,000 women or so who are, who are impacted. And one of the things that uh, was found, there was a study done on, a pilot study, on the impact of the food stamp ban on 
uh, women in te a woman in Texas, California, and Connecticut. And what it showed was this, this, the study found that uh, formerly incarcerated people who live in states that only <coughs> enforced a ban on who was receiving food stamps for, you know, who were denied access to food stamps because of felony drug conviction were more likely to report having gone an entire day without eating than people who lived in states that did not enforce the ban. Also, people who did not eat for an entire day were more likely to engage in HIV risk behaviors such as using alcohol, heroin, or cocaine before sex, or ex exchanging sex for money. Also, they showed that that individuals released from prisons are from prison are at high risk for food insecurity, and that the level of food insecurity among recently released prisoners uncovered the studies in, in, uh, in covered by the study mirrors the magnitude of food insecurity in developing countries. So, what we're seeing is that uh, just in this one uh, direct a uh, direct co uh, collateral consequence of the drug war, which is this federal food stamp ban. There is such a direct correlation to, to 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 food insecurity, but also when we talk about health and you know just listening in on some of the conversation that has been happening um, yesterday and um, this morning, when we talk about nutrition and the role of nutrition and making sure that Black women eat, we eat healthier, and but what does that mean when we don't have access to food and when the folks who need access to food and the most vulnerable in our communities are not uh, are not having are not getting access to the food and the care that that, that, that they need. Another uh, you know correlation that came up in one of the sessions that I attended yesterday was you know the focus on education. But one of the impacts of the of uh, the reforms that happened back in 1996 was that you were also denied access to um, federal education grants. Um, so if we are saying to, you know, that we need to improve um, health outcomes for women in our community, uh, there is no, and they, they can't get access to food, and they're saying you need to eat healthier. Um, you need to be educated, you need to ensure that your children are educated, but they're in communities where they're over-policed or where their parents can't improve their life chances because they don't have access to the benefits that they need, I think it's it's important for us to have this holistic conversation and to think about how our drug policies connect to our work um, on um, promoting health, connect to our education work, connects to our food security work. And one of the things that we say at DPA is that drug policy should be integrated into any policy making that is taking place because it's, it's having that budget. And, you know, so I'm going to stop you because I know Dion is going to talk about all of the political collateral consequences, I'm sure, and, you know, just the myriad of ways in which black women are assaulted uh, by, this, by this war on drugs that should end. And um, we see it showing up in addiction, we see it showing up in treatment, we see it showing up in drug courts, we see it, you know, the stigma uh, that is associated with drug use, the stigma that is associated with, um, with uh, drug users, and also uh, the stigma that's associated with drug selling, even though it's subsistence selling, because we're not talking about drug kidneys, we're talking about people who are selling drugs, either to support our habit or someone who's selling drugs just so they can live. So, So you all look so serious. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, this is some good. This is some good information. We are. And let me just say this. Thank you for giving me those stats. Um, I'm a JDA coordinator, coordinator, and I'm on this Baptist Juvenile Court. And one of the things that I'm finding with, as I'm listening to what you're giving, is racial ethnic disparities because a lot of kids that are black and Latino are locked up, but in particular in this city. It's African American kids. So it's like, how do we reduce? Oh, I'm about to take it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take my last two. 
think that's why we mesmerize you, right? Yeah, no, no. So, so when I, and I, I apologize for not fully introducing myself earlier. So my name is Dion Haywood. I'm the executive director of Women with a Vision Incorporated here in New Orleans. Women with a Vision has been around for 23 years now. And um, when we first started doing this work, it was all about HIV prevention and harm reduction. What we call that Women with a Vision, our foremothers, eight of them got together and they feared with the onset of HIV and what it was, um, they decided that they needed to do something within the African American community and that they would do a focus on black women because black women, we all know, head of household, normally, uh, not normally, but historically, we are the caregivers not only to our families, but to everyone and other people's families as well. Um, and for the first 15 years, that was what our work was about. Um, and Ava's Gray is an woman, she's been, I mean, she's been on us since we started. Um, and I want to tell y'all, when I started working, just volunteer with Women with a Vision, I was 19, I'm 46. Um, but, oh, Lord, mercy. Yeah, just, and yeah. Um, but I say that to say that um, after Hurricane Katrina, and Avis, you do know the four mothers, um, they were like, I was like, I really think we need to restructure the way the city is going to look, the way things are happening nationally. I think that we need to restructure, not just to strengthen our organization, but to really tackle the issues that women with a vision wouldn't, are not afraid to tackle. Um, and that we're dedicated not, and committed to because all of us are from the communities that we serve. You know, my mom um, grew up in Holly Grove. Danita Muse grew up in, um, uh, uh, about across the street from the Calio Project. Everybody from Women with Vision, Ashley's working for us now. She grew up uptown, even though she's leaving Women with Vision. Please. <laughs> um, I have to shoot that out, but I'm proud of you, but that's what Women with Vision is about. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, DPA, we are a partner of DPA, and I have traveled everywhere and anywhere to talk about this. I rarely ever get to talk about this at home, so I'm really excited about that. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask though, how many people in here are from New Orleans or currently living in New Orleans? So how many of y'all know what the landscape looks like in New Orleans when we talk about poor people, when we talk about black people, when we talk about our community and what that's what that looks like? Everybody, everybody like a girl. <laughs> you know, and I want and I, I want you to feel like you want to listen, but I also want this to be interactive. I want us to have a one of the one of the um, primary tenants at Women with a Vision is engaging community on these topics. So I in no way want to sit here and talk to you. I want us to talk and engage together. Um, so all the stuff Yolan talked about um, in the city of New Orleans um, and across the country, I've been saying it for a while and I feel like after sitting with Dr. Roberts last night, I was so excited because she just sealed the deal. You know that moment when somebody confirms that you are not crazy. Right. And the people that you hang with all the time, y'all not crazy together. Right. Um, but there is a war. There is a war, and it's a big one, and it is waged against black and brown women, against poor women, but black women in particular because of racism in this country. And I have, I've been committed this year, 20, like one of my uh, resolutions was, I'm calling it out, I'm not afraid to say white supremacy, white supremacy across the board. And if we don't understand what that framework looks like for us and how it's breaking down and how it still exists, I know people say we're living in the post, what is it, post racial Lies, 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 <laughs> you know, I just make a comment on that. And this, this is not to get anything going, but I just think that this would help our culture. Because, let, I mean, let's just face it, I mean, white people framed this country. They wrote the Constitution. When you look at the signers of the Constitution, mm -hmm. there was nobody of color. Right. So, I mean, a lot of things are engaged around that. But I just think that if white America would be more open and say, you know what, we are the white privilege, and we are the cause of the reasons that some of these things are happening, it may make the conversation a little bit more comfortable. It would be without the because sometimes when you say this, or I'm in situations and I say she's an angry black woman. Well, what do you expect them to do well, to us? Well, let me tell you. Okay. Let me tell you. See, you trying to go? All right. <laughs> so what I do know is because I'm that I'm that black woman. Okay. Um, but what I started telling people, no, I'm angry, but I have reasons, and I can give you the reasons and like them. 
and I'm not angry, I'm passionate about the love and respect. And I, you know, Angela Davis, she, the, the last time I was in her company, she said, I just don't know why, you know, it's just so easy to make us believe that black and brown people are so bad. Even those of us who identify with the culture, I wake up every morning knowing I'm a full black woman. I can't hide it, I can't put my nappy locks nowhere but right in front of me every day. And every day, I will find somebody that will make me feel like I should hate you because you look like me. And every day, the newspaper, even amongst ourselves, we will find reasons to dislike each other. And the reason we do that is because it's internalized racism. It has been taught to us. It is a system that has been handed down from beginning to end. It is why when we see people who are struggling with addiction, that the first thing we do is we shame them. See, because they're bad and they're wrong. And, and, and we just got to get rid of them. That's the same way they did with us right during slavery. Mm. And this is why I love women with vision, because I'm free to say what I want, because I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and our four months, like, there's no amount of funding that we get that keeps me from saying it. So I don't have to play nice with anybody, because nobody's playing nice with us. Yes. And Yolanda is naming off those stats, and every time I hear them, you know, they just, it, it cuts me almost. And it cuts me not just because I hear, but I see them at Women with Vision. I see them because a lot of our work is around um, fighting and trying to change policy. You know, and we can, you know, every now and then you can do it on a state level, but sometimes it's about exactly what you're talking about. It's about holding the conversation with those people who have the pen right in their hand. Because I don't trust the people at the state level or federal level to always agree, but there are changes being made across the country. I would I would encourage all of you to look at Drug Policy uh, DPA's website as well as One with the Vision's website. We have a list of other people that we think you should know. Um, but in saying that, you know, I get so angry. Like if I go on Facebook and even amongst my friends, social workers test them. They need to be tested. Test their asses for drugs. And I'm like, why? Why do y'all feel like it's okay to give the federal government that kind of access to our bodies? And drug use should be seen as a public health issue. Because I don't know if y'all noticed, but ain't nothing changed. The numbers are going up in terms of women who are going to prison, and the number of families that are being broken and decimated and just completely destroyed continues to grow. It hasn't changed. Everything in this, especially the state of Louisiana, we have a love for incarceration being the answer to every issue that are, they poll, they go arrest them. They on drugs, arrest them. They homeless, arrest them. They homeless, matter of fact, you're going to get arrested if you feed them now. What? So these are the little things that I think most people like, like you, you know it because you see it. And sometimes I'm sure you feel like me, like some days I feel like I'm completely alone in my thoughts <coughs> about what's happening. And so these conversations are important. You know, Yolanda brought up shackling. What woman in this room, I have two children. And I can tell you it was a long time ago. I was a teen mom, but it was a long time ago. And I can tell you I don't know what that would have been like had I been shackled. <laughs> That's violent in itself. The whole idea of arresting somebody is violent, especially when it's when the crime itself really doesn't match the punishment that people get. And again, this country is good for doing that. But it's for every, all the reasons that you said. It is that we operate out of a white supremacist framework. It is that it is lock them up and throw away the key, and in order to fix it, and then our communities are also fooled by the we need more cops to make us safe. Now, I'm a job, but I grew up in the city. <laughs> and if you're from somewhere else, if you grew up in any urban area, I'm sure you had the same thing. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. I don't feel any safer. Mm -hmm. I don't feel any worse. safer. If Sir Pass tell me he got 3,000 more cops, I'm going to be even more concerned. Yes. Mm -hmm. As Angela Davis said, it is not that black and brown people do more drugs. We're just um, over policed and we're under surveillance. Mm -hmm. See, because our communities are poor, and that's where the crime happens. We need more police to control you people. That whole concept to concern everybody in this room. Huh. If you think about it, but we really on a daily basis, people are not thought to think about it. People literally say, we need these police don't be around here to do nothing. And the police is in our neighborhood, not all the time do they do nothing. And sometimes they're a part of the problem. That, that might be another conversation for another day. <laughs> but 
when Yolanda talked about the shackling, these are all things that happen to women who use drugs. The removal of children, the sterilization of women who are, um, you know, some of the women who are in here tonight, some of my sisters that we were together with Dorothy Roberts, but it's all linked. The, the sheer thought that incarcerating you because you're struggling with an addiction, and, and some judges, we've had judges that said, well, I'm just trying to keep them safe, that's how they're going to get clean, but we have a public health system that's supposed to do that. Why are we not using that? When was the vision received a phone call about, about two months ago? And they wanted, I, wouldn't even, I didn't even answer it, because I just it got to the point I want answers to pity. I just can't do it. And the question was, we really want, when was, can you all explain why? We did a survey of treatment facilities across Louisiana, and there was a lack of black women there. And I was like, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. Like, for real. I, I cussed a little bit. My mom in the corner, she <laughs> But I was like, I can't believe it. And I asked, Ashley and Tim both worked for women, and I asked them twice with action to do this, and I was like, did somebody really send this message? <laughs> because I couldn't believe it. And I wasn't even like, when I got back, because I wasn't here, and they say, somebody called and really want to talk to you? And I was like, I refuse. Black women aren't given the option of treatment. Why? Because that's our plight. Y'all know it, because we ain't no good. Y'all know that, right? See, part of this thinking is, a, is extremely important for people to get. It's their own bias against us. It's our own bias against us that makes us think that we're not worthy of treatment, that all you need is jail, because that's where you're supposed to be, because you're not no good anyway. It's very basic. It's not, it's very simple. Sometimes I hate that it's so simple. But that's really what it is. And I was like, did they really ask that? See, when black women go before a judge, if you've been before that judge before, for some, you go to jail. You go to jail. For two years, Women's Division has worked with Judge Charbonnet, first to start out with Judge White, Judge Charbonnet, uh, NOPD, the DA, all these public defenders, and probation and parole, looking at a diversion program for women involved in sex work. Did you get the stats? I'm just curious. Did you get the stats? Huh? Did you get the stats? The stats of the number of women yeah. that are arrested? And diversion. In diversion? This is a program, this is a new one. Because they haven't tried this one before. Um, and I, I must say I'm actually proud. It just started June 1st. And I can tell you, we have like 12 new clients already. But what I continue to tell people is the majority of the women that come through your courtroom, and what kills me is when, see, the, the key is community. I'm going to tell you all how much power a community has. A community person can pick up the phone. You can, Ms. Williams, you can pick up the phone right now. And you can call your state rep and say, I went home and I'm tired of seeing these women on my street. He's going to get a while, he up his ass. And he's going to say, Law, my constituent, call me. Let me get something. Then they go to Baton Rouge and come up with the law, like y'all good friend Austin Baton just did. And know that I will tell this to him to his face. So he came up with a new law. And the new law was that when you see women, and it's specific in the law, women gathering or loitering, that the police have a right to approach them. I don't know what y'all but they never stop in NOPD from approaching anybody. We already have laws against prostitution. We already have drug laws that exist. Why are we creating more laws on top of laws for police to approach people? Right? Majority of these women that are on the street is two reasons. It's only two reasons. Nobody is getting rich. Poor black women are not getting rich. They don't do. We don't have the privilege to engage in that level of sex work. See, we don't have the privilege. See, a blowjob for us is ten dollars, five if, if that's all you're gonna get, and that's if you get it. We don't get the privilege of getting that text message from our uh, uh, um, escort service, who's calling and says, um, "Your date will meet you, Mr. Sarnes, so we'll meet you at the carousel bar in Montreal." Yes, right. <laughs> or the Collins Hotel at five for happy hour. Your salary for the weekend, three thousand dollars. Right. We don't get that. You know why? Because we're trying to eat. But most community don't see that because women have been vilified for being poor. You can't be poor nowadays. So if you have an addiction, it makes it worse. And so these are all the ways in which the, the war on drugs affects our community. And when you take the number, you think about the number of black men and young black men that are coming out of our communities. They come out, they go back in. They come out, they go back in. They come out, they go back in. How sustainable is that? So why is it a question to why our communities are broken? So these are all ways in which the drug war affects our communities. And it doesn't help when we have, when we have 
politicians who who see it, it wait, before I say that part, we have to think about the, um, the prison industrial complex. See, that makes money. Majority of prisons in this country right now are, are privately owned, which means you need people to be paid. Where you don't get the people, you always get the low paying group. So that means the people who are using drugs, the people who are involved in sex work, those are the people who fill jails. Okay? And then let's talk about drug testing companies. They just had a whole conference. They had a conference. There's a conference of drug testing companies. And then you'll find out that that person started that business after they were working at the, in the court system. And they figured it was going to be lucrative. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a business. And majority of the women who are tested through TANF or any type of probation program, that is not funded by the courts. You know who has to fund that? Them. If you can't be tested, then where do you go? Come on, y'all. Jail. And, and then who made the money? Them. And so this is the way that our communities are destroyed by the war on drugs. It also disproportionately the way it targets, like how you come home, how you get a job. If you have, you've been arrested, if you've been arrested, say, five times for marijuana, and a lot of people don't agree, and there's a lot happening in the state of Louisiana looking at um, marijuana sentencing, but I'm just going to tell y'all, look up Colorado. Mm -hmm. And look up areas in California. Who else? Washington. Washington State. Now, they, they look a little different than New Orleans. But at the end of the day, you have people bringing down, making millions of dollars now in Colorado because they own marijuana dispensaries. And young black men been going to jail, and some of them, you know, at a very young age, is going to be doing 40 to 50 years for a couple of joints. We just had a young, uh, uh, there was a guy a couple of months ago. Yeah. 13 years? 13 years. 13 yeah. years. Yeah. So, he just got, uh, so there was a case that we were, that DPA and, uh, and Dion and the others were. Came, became aware of, he had a third conviction. So he, I think he had two prior convictions for, right. like, for two joints. Yeah. And he got stopped again in New Orleans for, he had three joints on him. The judge said, you know what, I can give you a five year sentence. And Leon kind of there. That's, that's the one. Yeah. Um, Your DA. Appealed <laughs> that, appealed the judge's ruling for five years for, for three joints and said, no, he has to get 13. So he's now doing a 13-year sentence for three joints. And, um, Which most people in the world are having in pockets. <laughs> Just telling the truth. Right? No, no, the truth. Well, well, what I'm amazed at, what I tell people all the time is I'm forever, since I've been doing, since Women's Division has been doing such, such a um, more connecting the local policy and laws here to national issues, when I'm in certain settings, and Yolanda's going to laugh at me when I say this, I'm amazed that where I go and who I meet, and some of the people I get to meet and be with, um, I'm, I'm, I'm forward and honored because I've read their books. I've grown up watching them, and they help shape the way I think and how I move through the world. And then I'll meet people, and I was like, is he smoking? That one's smoking too. Well, it's okay. And, and I, I'm like, well, there's a whole lot of people people wouldn't know smoke smoke. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't believe everybody smokes. See how y'all do it? <laughs> you know, and that's to say, and I don't know what you think of judges who are fucked. Right. Have no, no, you seen that? Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, this is the happy drug for all those professionals. It really is. It's the people that got to chill out. It's the, it's instead of taking Zoloft. You light a joint. I mean, like in New Orleans in particular. I don't know about other cities and in Atlanta too, because I've been there. It you would be so go to jazz fest and look at the people with the dog and the heads on. No, just be smoking. But I'm saying the people got the so and so from the NC. Exactly. Now he's got his hat on with glasses. But I work with you. Oh, look at that. Oh, I like that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so it just becomes in our community. Like if I. Before we get into a discussion and we can discuss together, I would just ask you to think about what makes it okay for them and what makes it wrong for the young black kid. White supremacy, would you start? Oh, I want to make sure you yeah. <laughs> I would like to also point out the type of drugs, because I I live in L.A., so everyone got a dispensary card. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Right. You, when you get arrested, you just get your card out. You know, right. you right. out a card. See? It's just like a mandatory ID and dispensary card. And the type of drug you're testing for. 
Because you know, oh, I yeah, work yeah, in a yeah, place. Yeah. They will test you for marijuana, and but no one's testing you for oxycodone right. and things like that. And I'm so glad you that up. And then you're looking to see how what level that is in your system because it's easy to find an addiction if I if you have if you're using those drugs. But those are not part of the the, the grading of tests. Mm-hmm. And and I thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Because yeah. guess what? That is the only one. Mm-hmm. And I can tell y'all that is not that is not it. I live in Lakeview currently, and Lakeview has the largest largest um, number of heroin and opiate users yep. in Lake. I I'm, 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 I'm just saying. I'm like that. <laughs> I can share a quick story of a physician. You know, uh, we talked yesterday at the reception. I mentioned how the drug testing in the hospital when they come in to have their babies is so disparate, right? Can you share so, that? Um, Just yeah, quickly, because I think I think people should hear that. I wanted you to hear. So um, sure. So for for one, and I'll give this example as like a platform for it. There was a white woman who came in with her mother, and both of them, I'm like, y'all high. Like they was they were high. I know they were high. I've mm-hmm. seen high. So uh, and she was complaining to this day and the other. There was nothing wrong, and I'm like, mm, so I'm not quite right with you. But okay, so I call her physician, who is a white physician, who's you know, tall, dark, and handsome, Caucasian physician, and everybody loves him or whatever. I said, ah. I said, you want to, um, they, something not right with them. I said, oh, and her mom. I said, you want to do a uh, tox screen on them? Oh, no, 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 they always act like that. Mm-hmm. I said, maybe because they always high. <laughs> and, oh, no, oh, all right. But any black girl who comes in there, oh, yeah. if Ooh. she's single, if she has no good prenatal care, less than three visits, like there's a criteria even. Less than three prenatal visits, precipitous delivery, um, single alone for the birth, or whatever. They have all these different criteria. You're going to be tested whether you agree to be tested or not. Now, they, pa- they did pass some laws that technically the mother is supposed to consent to treatment. But when you sign your admission paperwork, yeah, no, no, yes. you're basically admitting to being tested. I mean, it is what it is. And even if they don't test the mother, they have 100% legal authority to test the meconium, which is the first poop or the urine of the newborn. So they will put bags. You'll go on the nursery and they'll have a little baggie on the babies, like it's a little boy and a little girl, they have it on their vagina, their penis, to catch the urine, to send that for tests without the mother's knowledge, without the mother's permission. Then CPS is uh, knocking on the social worker on the door yeah, they because they call it a little marijuana in the baby's urine, and you 19 years old, and your, your baby not going home with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So how many of y'all know that happened? Mm-hmm. It happened to It happened to you? It happened to you. I was discharged. I was actually sharing a story with her. I had twin girls, and my my grandmother was a midwife, and so he felt that my grandmother was overstepping when actually the things that were happening were wrong, and so he discharged me at seven months pregnant with twins. I had no choice at that point but to go to charity because nobody else would pick me up. I was right. high risk. Right. And then I had the complication at the time of uh, colitis, which they thought they kept telling me, "Oh, you have you have uh, hemorrhoids." But in actuality, afterwards, I found it was a colitis situation. But when I was in the hospital, um, they gave me a sleep sleeping pill. The nurse did not note it on the, 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 the paperwork, but thank God they had a pharmacy record. When I got ready to take my babies home, the social worker came in, and she was like, you can't take your babies home. You have to go through drug counseling. I'm like, drug counseling for what? I've never used drugs. What are you talking about? And I mean, I'm from the country. I live in St. James Parish. I'm a you know, young girl here in New Orleans, and I'm like, what is going on? And so they're telling me, well, we found drugs in your system. I'm like, what drugs? I don't do drugs. And so it took my mom to come and really go toe-to-toe with these people to allow my children to come home with me. Yeah, because they have to go back and get the record from the pharmacy showing that they have given me a sleeping pill, and they actually found it in my children. And and the other thing that happens is if a if a Caucasian patient, white girl comes in and she could be taking Prozac and Zoloft and Oxycontin Mm -hmm. and I got back pain, so I'm taking codeine every day and they have Mm -hmm. all these prescription drugs, that's all fine, well and good. And none of the, and we know a lot of those medications have been documented to create withdrawal and harmful effects in the newborns. But let somebody come in there who has a test for marijuana and they're it is and I'm, and they go and they give it to you in report as if they're saying that the mom like was killing her baby mm-hmm. or she tested positive for marijuana. And I'd be like, oh, okay, can you tell me what's really going on with the patient? Because I don't really care about that. And you rest assured that they will be calling social services to come and talk to that mom. Right. And that, so just to, you know, to 
tie in the, the why, especially for marijuana use. It's so it's easier to find is that if you use heroin, if you use cocaine, it goes through your system. Wait, it goes through your system. Right. right. If you use marijuana regularly, yes. it's the in THC your system. stays in your system right. longer. Right. Okay. So. And that's why it's used for medical purposes because it stays in your system longer. So if you're a cancer patient and it stays in your system longer, that's why it's still used for medical purposes. Yeah. Right. Even though they don't want to legalize it, that's the reason why. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody have any questions? We have 15 minutes left. Yeah, um, the presentations before this talked about the diversion program. Mm -hmm. And um, I worked in labor and delivery a little while at Charity. And getting back to this, they had a whole area that was set up for young girls with substance abuse. And they would all be put into this system, in that, in that Charity Hospital system. And it, it was almost like we have this pipeline yeah, from, you know, you're set up, you're stigmatized, you're marginalized, and you come into that system with all of that special screening going on there. Right. And then you have this pipeline that sets you up to be marginalized. I'm excited about this diversion program and some of the things that you all are doing. And this was the same question I asked the lady from Milwaukee this morning, because you all have some funding to do that. Um, that's not grant funding, that's something through the criminal justice system or, because sustainability Actually, is always an issue when you come up with these see, great so, ideas. so, okay, did you know this is one of the I know one of the digital. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm saying that, I'm saying that to say that if it wasn't for being a DPA partner and getting funding and our outside, we received no funding from the state of Louisiana in any way at all. Mm -hmm. And it could be, and I probably we probably won't till Jindal is out of office because, um, well, just to say, like about four four years ago, we we um, did a lawsuit. We did a lawsuit against the state of Louisiana against their solicitation crime against nature statute, and actually won, and had the law changed, and it removed like over 800 African American women off the sex offender registry just in Orleans Parish. I think it was about 400 in Jefferson Parish and it got smaller throughout because what they were doing, so solicitation crime against nature is basically solicitation of sex work. Um, and it was at the police officer's discretion. You didn't have to be caught in the act, which is why we kind of labeled it just a talking crime. And so what they did, who they targeted is poor women struggling with addiction, who of course you're on the street, where else are you gonna be? And so they target them, and if you are charged with solicitation crime against nature, it is, was an automatic felony, and you can get up to 20 years in prison. And those are the majority, I want to say it was like 79% 79, 79 of, the, of, the, of the women, of the people on the sex offender registry in Orleans Parish were.